Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is approaches to the problem. You've heard a lot about the problem of antibiotic resistance already, but now I want to talk about the types of approaches that have been, uh, are being done at CARE, the Center for Antibiotic Resistance Research, and also worldwide. In some of these, of course, you've heard about throughout the course, but I'm going to highlight a few newer things that are exciting, I think. So first of all, the uh, EU has split up the types of approaches that need to be done to deal with antibiotic resistance into six different categories. And these categories are therapeutics, diagnostics, surveillance, transmission, environment, and interventions. And you've heard about most of these a little bit, but I'm going to put them in a little bit of a framework. CARE at uh, Gothenburg University is organized in, along these themes as well. So we have each of the themes. In addition, we have education and outreach, and that's why we're doing this course. And we have members from a large number of different faculties at the university that are associated with all of these. Uh, so I'm going to start with therapeutics. I'm going to give you a, a definition and then give you a couple of cool examples, I think. So therapeutics essentially is finding new antibiotics. How do we find new antibiotics? And you have one lecture about this. But in general, natural products or their derivatives are the main source of at least half of the drugs in use today. And for that reason, a lot of effort is on natural products. And this kind of approach needs multidisciplinary research. You need biologists who will find new sources of antibiotics, who will initially find initial uh, hints that this might work as an antibiotic, which are then given to chemists who can modify these compounds and make them better, so they work better. They then go back to the biologists who continue to test them and see what uh, works the best, and back and forth like this. Until you have a very good candidate where it's then passed on to medical professionals for, for example, animal testing and further human testing. So many antibiotics are produced, though, by microorganisms. But only about 1% of microorganisms can be grown in the lab. So if you go out to the ocean and you pick up 100 bacteria, only one will grow in the lab. And in large part, that's because we don't know how to grow them. So it was mentioned briefly uh, during Morton's talk that there is a recent invention to try to deal with this problem. And this is something called the eye chip. The eye chip looks like this. If you look here, it's very small. It's about uh, six, eight centimeters long. And it has a lot of little holes. What you do is you take a sample of bacteria from anywhere, the ocean, the soil, whatever it might be, and you dilute it so that when you put this device in that solution, only one bacteria on average goes into each of those little holes. Okay? So you have like many, many, many test tubes for each bacteria. Then on top of that, you put these filters, and they are uh, membranes that allow nutrients to go in and out, but the bacteria are caught. So you have one membrane on the bottom and one membrane on the top. And then this device is all screwed together, and this is called the eye chip. What do you do with it? Why do you do this? So let's say I took a sample of soil, and I diluted it, put it in this device. Then what one does is bury that eye chip in the right environment where those bacteria really grow. Because we don't know what they need to grow, but it's whatever it is, it's in the environment where we got them. 
So you bury it in there. And in the experiments that uh, they've used this for, they leave it for, let's say, a month, a couple of weeks, they let it grow. Then what these researchers did is, this is hard to see, but they took that eye chip, they washed off the mud, and then overlaid it with bacteria. They took bacteria in a gel and put it on top of the eye chip without opening it up, incubated it with uh, these bacteria. In this case, it was Staphylococcus aureus. Left it to grow for some period of time. And what you could see is at certain locations in the chip, the bacteria, Staph aureus, didn't grow, indicating that there might be an antibiotic being produced by that bacteria. They then went back in, identified that bacteria, and eventually got this compound, which uh, Morton talked about briefly, Texa, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, to be honest, Texabactin. And Texabactin is really interesting because it has two targets in the bacterial cell, which makes it less likely to evolve resistance. Another type of environment being looked at, and this just came out in the last week, is they looked at bacteria associated with the root nodules of plants. And this is one particular plant. And they found that it produced an antibiotic that killed off bad bacteria that could affect the plant. So now they're in the process of identifying that antibiotic and seeing whether it might be useful either for plants to use as a general way of controlling disease in plants, or possibly later in uh, humans. Another therapeutic approach is shown here. It's resensitizing the bacteria to become sensitive again to the antibiotic. So there are a number of beta-lactam inhibitors that are being developed. This shows one. And by now, if you've been listening in this course, you should recognize that square structure there, which means it looks a bit like an antibiotic. It looks enough like an antibiotic that uh, the beta-lactamases will bind to it. It doesn't actually act as a very good antibiotic, though. But you inhibit beta-lactamase, and then all of a sudden they're sensitive again to beta-lactams. And recently, a new one has come out that people are very excited about called ETX 1317. And it inhibits uh, beta-lactamases of ESBL bacteria. Right now, it can only be used in IV treatment intravenously, but people are hoping they're, new, they're working on a new oral version of the drug. The last kind of thing I want to talk about in therapeutics has to do with the microbiome. The microbiome are the bacteria that grow on you. Uh, they grow in all parts of you. The major source in the gut, of course, but also the skin, etc. In recent years, there is paper after paper after paper associating the microbiome, the composition, the bacteria that are in the microbiome with a large number of diseases. I just want to highlight, though, that a lot of this is very new. It's not that clear how clear the connection is between any particular disease and the microbiome. But there are more and more and more indications. But one place where the microbiome actually has become a therapy is in Clostridium difficile infection. So if you take antibiotics... Uh, if you take a broad-spectrum antibiotic, you often lose all the bacteria in your gut or many of the bacteria in your gut. When that happens, certain bacteria, for example, C. difficile, can take over. And if you get sick with C. difficile, it's very hard to treat. It's very resistant to antibiotics. It causes long-term diarrhea and painful um, stomach, et cetera, or gut, et cetera. One of the current treatments for this is actually a fecal microbiota transfer. 
So you take the microbiota from another healthy person and repopulate the gut. The next one I want to talk about is diagnostics. As we heard about with Gunnar last week, it's often very hard to know when a doctor sees a patient, do you have a bacterial infection and is it resistant? And so they're using uh, antibiotics uh, based on their best guess as to what they should do. And as you know by now, this can take time. It can take days to find out whether or not you have a bacterial infection and a resistant bacterial infection in particular. And so what a number of groups are doing are looking for in vitro methods. That means not growing the bacteria necessarily, but looking for things that it, you can measure quickly. Ideally, in about half an hour at the doctor's office. That's the uh, dream. So we want a diagnostic test. The other reason we buy a diagnostic test is that, so for example, if there's an old antibiotic that isn't used much because there's a lot of resistance, that doesn't mean your infection isn't sensitive to that antibiotic. Let's say 90% are resistant, but 10% aren't. And so for that 10%, it would be nice if we could use that old antibiotic in those patients. And so another advantage of having a fast diagnostic test is that uh, you could use an older antibiotic instead of fancier new antibiotics. For example, urinary tract infections. This is such a common uh, infection that this is the focus of a lot of research right now. And I'm going to give you two examples of this. Three examples of this. First of all, in, here locally at Gothenburg, uh, there are people looking to be able to use sequencing, DNA sequencing, to very quickly identify what bacteria and what resistances. Right now, they can't do it in 30 minutes, but that is one of their aims. Others are looking at the proteome, and that means looking at the proteins expressed. So if you could measure the proteins, there are certain proteins only in some bacteria, not in others. And there are some proteins associated with resistance that you could measure. And a company here has been formed around this idea called 1928 Diagnostics. Another approach taken by a group in Uppsala, they formed a company called Astrigo Technology. They, they proposed, okay, yeah, we can't wait two days or a day, however long, to grow the bacteria. But we don't really need to wait two days because we can use microscopy to look at the bacteria growing and can see them grow very quickly, especially in the case of urinary tract infections that are usually caused by E. coli. E. coli can divide every 20 minutes. So if you could watch them, you could actually do things much faster. So what they've done is they've created a device where you have a sample, let's say a urine sample, that you put in this microfluidic chip. And bacteria in the sample are caught in these traps. So you flood this, you get on average one bacteria per lane on here. And you're going to have liquid flowing across this. So what happens? Well, what happens if my video will play is shown here. Okay. So what's happening here, the bacteria are trapped on the bottom. But you can see they're getting longer in dividing and they fall off out into the media. The media is flowing down, so they keep trapped in there. And so you can watch them actually grow and divide in real time, very quickly. This is actually a YouTube video that I think is on a 45-minute loop with music behind it if you want to watch it. But, but it shows pretty clearly what's happening in here. So what they've done is they created these microfluidic channels. You have one that is your control, your reference, and the other is the treatment. 
they are putting antibiotic on the treatment one and nothing on the other. And then they use a microscope and measure how fast the bacteria are growing. So they can do this incredibly quickly and actually watch this. And what this looks like is shown here. So here's the reference, and this is the growth rate, how fast it's growing. And it's growing at a certain rate, probably around 20-minute doubling time. And that stays constant in the experiment. But the other one that they treat with antibiotic quickly grows at a slower and slower rate. So within, in this experiment, you can clearly see that within five minutes, you can see a huge difference. They tried this with a number of different antibiotics, and shown here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see that in most cases, you can find out which antibiotic is effective against this infection in less than 30 minutes. So this device is being produced now and is being tested in doctor's offices. And my guess is it will, if it works as well as advertised, it will be available very soon. The last uh, approach to diagnostics I want to mention, uh, this was a group in the U.S. at Caltech that created a test that looked, again, this is a 30-minute dream. They're all, all advertising for 30 minutes. That works on a slightly different premise. Here you have the sample, and you have no antibiotic or antibiotic. And what they do is they let the cells grow for a short time. Let's say, I don't remember, uh, 15 minutes. And then separate the bacteria onto a chip and label the DNA. The, or they're labeling the DNA during the growth. What you should find is cells that have are growing, are making DNA. You get more DNA. Cells that are inhibited by the antibiotic aren't growing. They have less DNA. And as shown here, the reference, most of the individual cells are labeled, but here very few are, indicating the antibiotic is working. So on to the third theme, which is surveillance. And as we've talked about, we need to know what type of resistance is out there so that doctors can make the best uh, guesses as to which antibiotic to give you. In all the maps we've shown you in this course, it's almost always just Europe. And the reason is we don't have data in most of the world. And so uh, Joachim Larsen's group and another group are working on creating a very inexpensive a detection device to be able to sample anywhere very cheaply and so that they can bring it back to the lab and figure out how many antibiotic resistance uh, bacteria there are. So they want to create this device which can be sent all over the world. All the people have to do is put it in a water or wherever they're going to put it and then send it back to Sweden. Uh, so they're working on this and or to another lab somewhere else uh, to be able to quickly get better surveillance data. Then we have the environment, and Joachim already talked about this a lot, um, which is that we need to know how frequently antibiotic resistance is occurring in the environment and how to prevent it. This slide, which I don't remember if he shows, just summarizes that you have sources of antibiotics coming from hospitals and people, as well as agriculture and pharmaceutical plants, all leading to resistance to some degree. But we don't well know how much. Uh, the next theme is transmission. Transmission has to do with, uh, transmission in this sense refers to conjugation. So we talked about how uh, DNA can be transferred directly to other bacteria. And this is my personal project, so, and Martin's. Uh, we have a project looking for inhibitors of conjugation. So we want to be able to develop a drug that will stop conjugation. 
that could slow down the, the spread of resistance. It's not going to solve it. It's going to slow it down. And the way we've been doing this is, uh, is by assaying how well bacterial strains can conjugate, transfer that plasmid. Ultimately, we'd like to be able to minimize conjugative spread, both in uh, humans, animals, and the environment. Given the fact that plasmids are very diverse, we're focusing our efforts on chromosomal genes in the bacteria. So, but there was no good way to do this. All right, we need to look at lots of genes and lots of organisms. And so we developed a system to be able to quickly look at conjugation. And we used it to look at 4,000 mutants of E. coli with four different conjugated plasmids. And how do we do this magic? That's a lot of uh, assays. Basically, we're using auger plates where we can pin 1,536 different conjugation pairs. So we can quickly get a large number of growth curves, or mating in this case, uh, results in a very short amount of time. So essentially, we screened all of these in a matter of weeks, basically. So using this, we found a number of mutants that don't conjugate well. So here's our control that conjugates well in blue. And then in green, for example, is something that conjugates very poorly. And so we're in the middle of figuring out what are all these uh, mutants that we found. We think it's likely we find mutants that affect the expression of the genes on the conjugated plasmid or those that have a problem making this pilus, or those that affect replication or transfer of the actual DNA. But we're still in the middle of doing this. All right, and then the next uh, theme, which you've heard a lot about in the last uh, couple of lectures, are interventions. So how do we influence people? to do the right thing. And you heard a lot of discussion about this. And the people we want to influence are doctors and veterinarians. We want to influence the livestock industry. We want to affect environmental pollution. Governments, of course, are involved in all of this. And people like you. And as you've heard, the social scientist's role then is how do we encourage good antibiotic stewardship? How do we decrease environmental pollution? And there's no clear answer to that, but there are hints that you've heard about. Okay, so lastly, if you are interested and want to learn more, I have a couple of websites that are recommended. CARE, of course, has new research. ebug.eu is appropriate for younger people, so high school level. Um, students. REACT group is a advocacy group that is fighting to improve um, knowledge about this problem as well as influence governments, etc. Antibiotic-resistance.se, that site will have this entire course on it, including the quizzes and everything. So in the short term, you have Canvas, of course. But if you ever want to go back to antibioticresistance.se, they're not up there yet. The old version of the course is up there now. But in the future, you can tell your friends to watch all the videos. They'll all be organized there. And then CARE has a Facebook and Twitter account if you want to follow the research going on at CARE. And then Microbiology News is my own Twitter and Facebook accounts where I post about different types of research in microbiology, but a large amount about antibiotic resistance because it's important. And that's it. Um, thank you very much.